Okay, hello everyone. How's, how's everyone doing at ChefConf? I hope everyone's having a great day. And I posted the link on uh, Habitat Slack, so we have some other people joining uh, online. That's cool. So I'm going to talk about, um, well, I'm going to do a little demo basically of uh, HA Postgres running in Habitat. It's a, it's a plan I spiked a couple months ago and uh, we've been partnering with Chef now to kind of getting it to a production ready state. And um, so I'm Justin Carter, I work for Stark and Wayne, but I'm also a uh, core maintainer of the Habitat project. So uh, let's jump right in. This is being recorded. Let's see, I have to say a little disclaimer I got the time zone math wrong by an hour. I thought I was gonna have this demo one hour ago and now it's like 10.30 where I am. So I'm a little bit tired, <laughs> more tired than I expected. So if I have so more typos than usual, that's, that'll be the reason. All right, um, let's have a look. First, let's go to the uh, Stark and Wayne Habitat Plans repository. I'll just check out everything. So you'll find this repository on GitHub um, and it contains all of the plans that Stark and Wayne support currently. We'll be looking at the uh, PostgreSQL one. Um, and I assume you've been to the entry level Habitat um, talks and you know a little bit about it. So I'm not gonna cover the basic stuff. Uh, Stark and Wayne has a deployment pipeline that publishes all of our plans automatically uh, up to the Habitat Public Depot and also we export our plans as Docker containers. So my little demo I'm going to do using Docker Compose because I'm on a Mac and that's a very nice way to bring up kind of uh, multiple containers in a, in a world. So I've the, the demo code, if you want to check it out later, the Docker Compose files are on my GitHub account, bodymynotschefconf slash demo, uh, dash demo, sorry. But let's jump right in now. So this is the co Docker Compose file. Um, and we're gonna basically bring up three PostgreSQLs and we want them to cluster. We're achieving that by passing in the same group um, name for all of them and we're pointing them we're giving them a peer which is this standalone this has absolutely no point there's no point of having the standalone thing for the for the purpose of the demo it's only basically to uh, allow the um, PostgreSQLs to uh, no sorry the supervisors to to form a ring and to find each other that's all that's really for it's some kind of permanent peer that I used to bootstrap in this case. And the topology, of course, this is the most important thing, is gonna be leader, because that's what the whole demo is about, bringing up a cluster. So we're gonna use Habitat's native leader election to um, make sure that there's only gonna be one master and two uh, followers. And we'll see how that work out, works out. So let's jump straight in. I'll bring that up. ChefConf demo, and I'll bring it up with Docker Compose. So DC is my alias for that. And we'll see that that didn't work because I have some state left over. Clear up Docker and let's try again. So we see a whole bunch of output and um, after some bootstrapping, this of course is mingling the output of all the containers together. But after some bootstrapping, we will actually have a stable cluster. And we're gonna investigate that a little bit. Um, for that purpose, I have another container. Uh, I've called it client that I can access these. So that's the, this container down here. And with the DNS that Docker Compose, um, sets up for us, I can access these various uh, instances 
by the, the DNS. So anticipating that I would be nervous and tired, I've added a few commands <laughs> to a readme that is gonna help me get this working. Right, so that went quick. So what did we do here? Uh, for each host, Postgres one, two, three, echo the host, connect to the host as the admin user, the password and the username is just the defaults of the plan. And I'm going to select PG is in recovery. So I'm jumping right into the details of Postgres clustering. I don't know if there are any Postgres experts around. Uh, probably if there are, you know more than me, I'm kind of more figuring out the packaging layer, which is of course what Habitat takes care of. But um, we'll have to look at some Postgres details to, to understand this. So this PG is in recovery, queries the individual databases to find out if they're basically streaming from a master or if they are the master. So we see PG3 here as a false, which indicates that that instance is the master. That's one way of finding it out. Uh, so I'll set a little leader as PG3 and I will um, connect to it. And I will also make sure that I can create a table. I can also write something into that table. I can obviously, and I'll select uh, from it. Oops, select, select, there we go. So I've written to the master and I've inserted a little value into the table and I'll run this, uh, this one iterate over all of them and we would expect the value to have replicated, which it has. So again, for each one of the hosts, I'm uh, checking to see select from foo and we see the value has replicated. So that's one component of the clustering. Let's have a look at the streaming output. Uh, just at a glance, I'll go into this a bit more detail later on, but we can see the health check, for example, of the replicas telling us that well, the replica can see the master and that the, uh, the, the diff of the wall log, streaming wall log is at zero. So it's considered a healthy replica because it's caught up. It could, if you want to fail over, you wouldn't have any data loss at this point in time. Yeah. Um, right, so as a next step, let's actually uh, kill the master and see what happens. Ooh, uh, PG3, so DC stop PG3. Oh, I'm in the wrong um, folder. So stopping the node, and we can see that one of the nodes was killed here. And um, if that was in fact the leader, I will expect a, uh, and there we go, an election to get kicked off. And we see a lot of uh, text streaming by as the reconfiguration hooks kick in. So here's a little detail. I'll, I'll go a bit more into the individual hooks and show you the code in a second. I'm just kind of giving the superficial demo first. So here we see that there's this concept of suitability. So the, the, the two nodes that were still alive got queried for how far caught up they are to the, were to the master, what their wall log state is. And in this case, they're both identical. They were both caught up. So it'll be, a, I guess, a random election. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but it, it doesn't matter which one gets elected leader. If one would be more caught up than the other, then that one would be prioritized. Um, our config gets re-rendered. You may know this from other habitat plans. You may have seen this. Eventually, the uh, reconfigure get hook gets called. Uh, and in this case, PG1 seems to be promoting itself to be the new master. Uh, and Let's have a look how, how, how that went. So let me go back to the client. I'm still here. Let's see if um, that was the from foo. This is the PG in recovery. And PG1 is not in recovery, so that is indeed the master. Um, there's one other thing I can do, actually, that I forgot. And that is, well, no, PG3 is obviously gone. I need to set the leader to PG1. And this is going to be a select. This is also an interesting thing from PG stat replication. This gives us a little bit, well, okay, the font is now so big that we can't really read this very well. But this would give us a, um, 
more details about what followers are connecting. And uh, I guess that's almost the, all the essential stuff. Uh, what I'm gonna do is completely remove the state of PG3 by deleting the container. It was stopped, but now I've completely deleted it. And now I'm gonna bring it back up again. And uh, I expect obviously it will join the cluster again here, the logs are streaming by. And we see somewhere here, it's a new member joining. So we see something like bootstrapping from leader, et cetera. And uh, here the first health check, the diff is pretty high because it's just joined and obviously there's already information uh, in, the, in the cluster. So let's see if, uh, if we can see now. Oh, interesting. Terminated connection due to unexpected postmaster edit. Well, so maybe I made a mistake somewhere along the line and I'm not gonna try and repeat it because I wanna move on. But that's bas the basic setup. You have, uh, you have a cluster, you can kill the master and it still works, right? And you can bring new nodes back and, and it still works. So um, I assume there are no questions to there. That's not particularly, um, you know, interesting you would expect that to to work i was gonna i actually had a joke prepared saying if this demo would work i would say oh look how brilliant i was in uh leaving out all the edge cases that could have made this fail somehow i actually <laughs> even though i didn't deliberately enter an edge case made it fail but so goes live demos anyway let's have a look at the plan um to make it look like i know something all right so this plan is actually quite, quite interesting. Uh, I've got about 15 more minutes. So let's, let's take a look at what we can look. So we have the config directory, which you may or may not know. I, well, I assume you know it because you may have seen some habitat stuff before and the hooks directory. And we have a tests directory, which is um, something that we've introduced into all the Stark and Wayne plans. We test them in our uh, CICD pipelines in an automated fashion, but this isn't something that's um, coupled to, um, to habitat in general. It's just a pattern that we use. So, but the config and the hooks, that's something definitely that's um, what we're gonna look at. So all these hooks are, that we use in this instance of uh, cluster Postgres, we actually use, I think every single hook that is available to, um, to, uh, to the ha habitat uh, supervisor life like process lifecycle um, system. And some of these hooks actually I added in, in pull requests specifically to support this use case of clustered stateful services. Um, so let's have a little look at them in more detail. Uh, that's the init hook and this is the, um, let's look at the run hook as well. Okay, let's see how I'm doing for time. All right, pretty good. So I'm gonna just go through, um, I'm just gonna go through these hooks and, and just talk about some basic observations, like things that we, we learned while iterating on these plans and, and improving them. So the first thing right away is, you see I'm using this package path for helper, uh, this one, and I'm bringing in core bash. So a lot of the core plans, and uh, we started using that too, just use a regular shebang with uh, bin bash or even bin sh. And in most cases that works. But in some cases, it doesn't work. And we got burned on, on quite a number of the plans that we were fleshing out to make them kind of production ready or enterprise ready, what have you. Um, we got burned with this um, due to differences in Bash in different environments. And you wouldn't believe it, but it does exist. Like, for example, exporting Docker, you're running in BusyBox. BusyBox has a minimal Bash, doesn't support everything. Um, then we have a Bosch um, habitat plan, uh, sorry, a habitat Bosch release, which is, uh, Bosch is another provisioning system that we can run stuff on VMs. And um, there, uh, like another assumption that is made on BusyBox is that SH is just symlink to Bash, but it, on, um, on the Bosch provisioned VMs, it wasn't the case. So we had the shebang bin SH and it didn't work because it wasn't symlinking to Bash. So there were these, um, you know, differences in environment, in environment, even with something as simple as the shebang. So now that that's happened to us quite often, we're really uh, starting to consistently use the opportunity that Habitat gives us in pulling in 
uh, really everything in this um, in in the habitat context and relying only on and depending only on the stuff that is managed by habitat. So it really makes sense, even though you won't see it in a lot of the core plans. If you are doing something more involved, uh, then you can solve you know avoid a lot of frustration by just going with core bash and feeling good about that. So another um, pattern that we've kind of uh, been iterating on is, and this plan is the one that's, that's evolved the most in that case, is that under a config, we have, uh, in this case, a, a functions um, file. So the, the, there's, there's one thing about Habitat that if anything under the config directory changes, so any of these files, sorry, I'll make it, any of these files under the config directory changes, that will um, trigger the reconfigure hook to run, right? So ideally things that should be like changing uh, potentially according to some kind of configuration need to be in this directory. But often I found things actually that, <laughs> that change are actually things that also get rendered into the hooks. But a, a hook changing won't actually trigger the reconfigure hook to run. So anything that needs to trigger the reconfigure hook needs to be in the config directory. So one way that of solving this is just to add a file like this functions.sh that will contain uh, most of the rendered, uh, rendered values that may or may not change, like for Wally, some AWS credentials, or I don't know, uh, the username, replication name, and password for Postgres. I don't know, all of this kind of stuff um, needs to be in the config directory. So I've just, we've just been using this pattern that, you know, uh, anyway, this is a good separation of, uh, of, of concerns and, and makes it also more readable. In this case, it's also a good, uh, good way to structure the code that you extract these, these functions that we're using in the hooks into, into another file. So it kind of works for, for two things in, in that case. Um, making sure that things get triggered and also extracting the, um, the functions and improving the, the code in that way. So that's the next, the next step of the, of the hooks is to source this functions.sh file that will have the you know, up-to-date config of anything you may want to run. And from then on, and I'll just stay with this difference between the functions file and the, and the hook file. So as you can see, this on the left side, now I have opened the init hook and all of the, um, let's say logic, like conditional logic is in the hook itself. So in this case, it's a conditional render if Wally is enabled or here it's even a, a bash level. If, if this um, version file exists, that means the database has already been initted, perhaps with an earlier version of the plan, the plan got updated and we see there's already data there. So we don't wanna blow that away and create a new, da um, a new database. So um, that kind of, if then else logic, branching logic resides in the hooks and the, um, the simple procedural stuff, you know, do this, do that, write stuff out, I don't know, what have you. That's uh, kind of stuff that we've all, uh, that we've extracted into this, um, into this functions file so that we have kind of the, the heavy lifting of the, uh, of the, that needs to happen procedurally in this file and the, the logic kind of, the, the flow of the logic at a glance in the hook. So that's kind of a nice separation. Um, so the rest of this file is basically has to do with details of the plan and Postgres. I'm trying to keep my intro a bit more generic on how you would create a, um, a plan yourself for some kind of clustered service. So I will talk about another detail now, and that is this unless follower. Let me see how I'm doing for time. Okay, I'm going to move on. So yeah, this unless follower, this is kind of interesting. Um, we have in Habitat the option to query like my state, uh, the, the state of the, of the local node and, um, and conditionally uh, render stuff depending on whether I'm the leader or not. So, um, so why this unless follower, right? That's uh, the, re the reason for it is that we wanna support both clustered and, um, and standalone, right? We wanna just be able to run a single node that's not clustered. So, in this case, what is this logic saying? It's saying, I, uh, it's, it's, it's deciding which node should actually create the database and the other ones that aren't creating the database should bootstrap from, from this database. So if I would do this, um, if service.me.leader, well, 
this would work in the in the clustered case, but it wouldn't work in the standalone case because in the standalone case there is no leader, and that's why I've got this uh, kind of unless construct in here. So that's something to um, to watch out for. So unless follower works both when I'm the leader or when it's standalone. Uh, so that's the detail that is uh, that is kind of interesting. Um, all right, so we've looked at the init hook now. It kind of so the leader or standalone will create a database. Uh, let's look at the run hook again. I had it open before. It's kind of the same thing. Source the functions. Um, you know, write out some config that needs to be written. Here's some more logic. Um, so here it is if I'm a follower because it has nothing to do with the standalone use case. So if I'm a follower, then I'm going to, well, if we have Wally, I'm going to bootstrap from Wally and Postgres users will, will probably know what that is. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, bootstrap from a base backup. And this is a very interesting line. Um, copy over the recovery config because the recovery config is the thing that's going to actually, you know, tell us where to restore from if we're using Wally or like the primary connection info. Okay, let's see if I can uh, make this in. Oops, no. Wow, I never split. <laughs> that's weird. I never do a horizontal split, so I didn't know how to do that with a um, shortcut. So I did it like this. So here we go. Now we can read it a bit better. So this is the primary config info and it's um, rendering out where my leader is. And that is being copied into the data directory in the run hook. So just before starting the process, we copy that over so that there's the latest information of where the replica will find the leader. That's uh, if I'm the follower. <clears throat> so um, let's have a look at how the failover case works. So that logic is in the, whoops, um, reconfigure hook. Here we go. This is the reconfigure hook. Again, we source the functions to get that out of the way, have a um, focus on the logic and the hooks. Um, so again, I have the unless follower construct that I, uh, that I already explained. So in a standalone case or a leader case, this will be, um, this will be triggered. And here we check for that recovery configuration if, um, if it's present or not. So if we were a follower when the run hook got triggered, then this would be uh, present there. If uh, there's been a new election, then uh, it would still be there. If I, uh, and this is the hint that this um, node used to be a follower and needs to promote itself. The, the presence of this file indicates that. So that's how I know that I need to promote myself um, the reconfigure hook runs in parallel to the run hook. That's kind of a habitat detail. Um, but this is waiting for the local node to come up and eventually I can use this um, PG command to, to promote myself. And if I am have Wally configured, start Wally, which should only run on the leader. All right, I don't think, um, I want to go, there's, there's a whole bunch of more stuff I want to go, I could go into, it's, a, it's a quite an involved plan. Um, but I would like to leave a little bit of time open for questions. Um, just maybe for clarification, maybe I didn't explain something well. So shoot, if there's anything someone wants to know. Can you hear us, Justin? Uh, kind of. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I wasn't sure. Fletcher, that's you, right? Yeah, and um, this is amazing work, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Fletcher. <laughs> so that wasn't a question, but <laughs> I'll, like, I'll take it anyway. <laughs> you should just answer it, Justin. You should be like, yes, this is amazing All right, so if there's no questions, I could do a super, super fast uh, five minute fly through of, uh, of a backup and restore of Redis and Shield without explaining anything. It's just a short demo since there don't, doesn't seem to be any, huh? You can go long if you want. I can go long, okay. So it's, it's up to you guys. We can have a, a really short look at a flash, uh, flash demo of a, of a Redis um, Shield backup and restore thing, or you can ask questions. <laughs> okay. Can't really sense the room without being there, but I'm just gonna go ahead with the Redis thing because it's pretty cool. Um, 
Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, right. I called it the uh, shield. That's right. Okay. So, um, Oops. Oh, I'm in the wrong. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right, so what are we looking at now? Well, Stark and Wayne, we work on really large scale um, distributed systems, mostly Cloud Foundry, but all kinds of stuff that's related to the platform as a service space. Um, lots of data stores, da da data stateful stuff is always the big open question. Everyone knows how to do 12 factor, but how do we do state, right? And so backup and restore is obviously an important part of that, um, of that supporting that story. And so we've uh, created the shield solution to uh, have like a pluggable way of doing backup and restore. And uh, we've ported this to, um, to Habitat. So if I have a shield CLI, let's see if I can connect uh, policies dash K. Awesome. So the shield, there's a shield daemon, which is kind of the central logic uh, section and the database that it needs to connect to. And in this Docker compose file, I'm bringing both up via habitat. I'll just put this up here to make them closer together. So here we're using a binding, which is another concept in, uh, in uh, Habitat that I didn't use in the cluster example. So that's the shield daemon. And um, shield has a couple of entities. So let me, uh, let's see, shield commands, I think. Right, so these are kind of the entities that shield uh, deals with. A target, something I wanna back up, a schedule, when I wanna back it up, policy, how long the archive that gets created is valid for, stores, where I wanna store it to. So this is pluggable, the store could be AWS, could be Azure, could be, I don't know, a file system. And a job is like the, the join table of all these things, like actually running the backup job. So, and then there's the agent, which is the thing that's actually going to perform the backup. It's typically co-located with the, um, with the uh, data store. And um, so that's kind of the, the, the three components that make up Shield. And in this case, the agent is bound to, um, uh, to the daemon and it can configure itself. So here I've made some configurations. Uh, I can, for example, use the, um, right, shield uh, to, well, let's get the schedules because that's an easy thing to see that it's 4 a.m. Uh, because it's via bringing up the shield agent, I've pre-configured. I could also configure this stuff by the CLI, but I'm jumping over that. I'm just doing it automatically already. I can configure these things um, uh, statically via, via habitat, via the agent. So uh, to show you that this is actually picking up, let me just uh, kill this and bring it back up with the 5 a.m. Oops, and you can see that um, now <laughs> the new one, when it comes up, should have the, the 5 a.m. configured once, it's, once it comes up. Uh, there we go, 5 a.m. So this is actually being configured from, uh, from this agent. Now, what does this have to do with Redis? Well, the Stark and Wayne Redis image has the shield agent baked in already, pre-baked pre into the container. So Habitat has this uh, uh, feature to run multiple services um, on one supervisor, and we're, we're making use of that. So we have this bootstrap from backup flag, and we're setting these pre-configured um, uh, entities, the schedule, the retention, and the store, which we configured by this, uh, by this agent down here. So um, given that we're bringing up a Redis and we're pointing it at the store, the schedule, and the retention policy that it should use, it will configure itself as a target. So, so we have already a Redis default target in here just by bringing up Redis and binding it to shield. And that's it. That's all we need. And we don't only have a, a target, but we also have a job to go with it, which I can run. Uh, run dash, well, no, before running it, I will actually use the Redis CLI to put something in it because then I can prove that it's working. Uh, password set hello world. All right, and then I'm gonna get hello. 
and the world is in there and now I'm going to run the job and it's spitting out a task ID that I can look at with dash K because it's self-signed cert. So we can see this is the output that a job has. It kind of uh, validates the target and the storage space and it runs the backup, uh, which means now I have a um, archives. I have one valid archive of this Redis thing. So what am I going to do now? Well, obviously, the only reasonable thing to do is to um, stop Redis. And uh, even more reasonable thing after I've stopped it is to uh, remove it completely, kill the container, bye bye container. So Redis is gone. Oh my God, my data is gone. Well, luckily we did pull a backup before it. So how do I get it back? Well, like I said, the agent is pre-baked into the Redis container and I have this flag bootstrap from backup. Oops, uh, dash D comes here. So bringing up Redis, now this bootstrapping process is a, gonna take a couple seconds. Um, that output doesn't really help us. So I will um, uh, just run this here, Redis CLI. Oh, this isn't, where did I run it here? Redis CLI here, get hello, and it's back. Oh my God, what did I do? I didn't do anything. It just bootstrapped itself. The binding in um, that Habitat provides to the shield allowed Redis to inspect that shield is available in the environment. It allowed it to inspect that there was a backup already available for itself, for its uh, ID. And it was able to pull in that backup before starting its own process, thinking that's the reasonable thing to do. So that was the five minute Shield Redis demo to go along. And that's it for today. Thank you. <laughs> Although you're probably going to bed soon, right? I'm going to bed right now. It's 11 and I'm pretty tired actually. <laughs> awesome job, Justin. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao.